once you build up enough capital, then it becomes an issue. Where do I place that capital? You know, and part of that capital was, okay, now we need to start holding some of these properties that we're coming across and building our, our rental portfolio. All right, welcome everybody. Um, I am very excited because for today's episode, I have a good friend, Paul Amagetcher on, and he has great experience in all kinds of areas of real estate. We have known each other for years, and I know you're going to benefit from his story and learn a lot from all the different types of deals he's done over the years. So welcome, Paul. Thanks for joining me. Hey, thank you for having me, Chad. Yeah, glad to. Been meaning to for a while, so glad we finally got it. Oh yeah, we, we've had a few uh, Chipotle meetings. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I was thinking back to uh, all those uh, advanced investor meetings at Paul's oh, yeah. house way back when. And uh, so, but for those who you know don't know your story, how did you get started? I know where you are now and you have a rental portfolio and you've got a big flipping business you've got crews going and you do wholesales and i mean you have a large real estate business now but how did that process really get its first start okay well a little bit about my background um i'm a material science engineer i have a material science engineering degree from the university of illinois so um in 2002 when i got out of college i got hired on with a company called ak steel in middletown so I was a steel worker, I was, a, I was an engineer, and I actually got hired on as a shift supervisor in the steel making department. And when I was there, one of the guys that was another supervisor next to me said, hey, you know, we're making good money. I was making 50 grand, you know, out of college. So I was like, oh man, this is sweet. I, I went from not having any money to making, uh, you know, four grand a month, you know, it was like a thousand a week. I was, I was like, this is life, I'm 20, 22, didn't have anything in the world. So it was like, the, I don't want to say I hit the lottery, but it was like, this is, I got plenty of money, extra, extra money to spare. And then this guy kind of hits me with a wake up call. Like, Hey man, you think you want to do this for life? You want to, this is what you want to do for life? You make 50 grand. I'm like, oh, well, it's good right now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but he's like, well, you got to, you got to read this book, reach, reach that for that. So I'm like, okay, sure. yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll check into it. And, um, I think it took a while, but maybe another six months or so, I finally uh, read the book and it kind of opened my eyes. And uh, you know, I was like, "Man, I gotta, I gotta get into this real estate. This sounds like uh, a life-changing thing." You know, so I got inspired by Rich Dad Poor Dad. Um, That's awesome. That's amazing how many people that book has influenced. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, what was the first step? I mean. A whole bunch of people have read that book and a whole bunch of them still don't own anything any okay. assets. so where did you where, where, where'd you go from there so um that being the eye opener it kind of gave you know it touched on real estate a little bit but it wasn't a more it wasn't a practical book it wasn't a book about here's how you do real estate it kind of gave you a vague idea of okay i buy this house and i, I fix it up and i make money but it didn't go into the details of how to do uh, operate that um those businesses. So I think I, the next book I read was, I think, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor. And that kind of um, went into the details as well. And back then, I think Carlton Sheets was around as well. So I, I kind of found one of those old Carlton Sheets uh, um, books and read that as well. You know, so you kind of figured it all out. But it, um, I think The re Millionaire Real Estate Investor really got me to thinking, okay, the biggest thing I took away from it, even if you don't buy a hundred houses, it's like buy your house cheaper. So I bought my first house using some of the techniques from then. It was like, I bought a sheriff set, uh, actually it was a bank owned foreclosure and I, I got it. It wasn't a good deal for a flipper, but it was a good deal for a homeowner that was gonna live in there and fix it up himself, do a little, it was pretty much a paint and carpet uh, renovation, you know, so it wasn't much, much issues with it. So that was one of the reasons I bought it because I'm like, well, worst comes to worst, I could do the work myself. <laughs> you know, I could paint. You know, there was some small yeah. drywall work that needed to be done. I could do that. So it was, it was, it was a very uh, easy renovation. So I used that. I bought that house, 
And of course, I mean, I was living in an apartment at that time. So I bought a house, my payments didn't go up much. And then what I ended up doing was I did a cash out refi. So it was almost like a bear for myself. I bought, it, I bought the house, improved it. I bought it for like, I want to say 87 uh, with the, I spent about maybe six grand in uh, renovations and then it appraised at 130. So nice. and, uh, this was in 2005. So I was able to refinance and I pulled like 30 grand in equity out of it. My payments went, went higher, but I had 30 grand in cash on me. So I used that 30 grand to purchase my first rental, which it's a, uh, <laughs> that was a, uh, not necessarily a bad thing, but it, it, was, it was a rough rental. I, I didn't have any uh -oh. real construction background and you know you trust people to do work for you and it was that was a story in itself well hey let's get into it it sounds like a good one <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it, it sounds like all right just, just hitting all the pain points huh yeah. <laughs> Might and, well and, open up those wounds <laughs> right off the bat right yeah so i picked up this uh <laughs> that's so, right okay so the the first house the eighty seven thousand that you cash out refied that one you lived in yes correct? i lived in that house okay and then i ended up actually house hacking it because i had my buddy moving with me and he was paying me uh rent so that kind of um you know he was we were all kind of living in apartments at the same time so you know being able to get him to move in with me kind of cut, cut my cost down a little bit so my cost you know uh, instead of paying i think 900 or 950 i can't remember the exact number but now he was paying um, four hundred dollars a month to me. That included all utilities and everything else. So, but that cut my cost down severely. So I was I wasn't you know spending a lot of money living in the house by myself. Now that's awesome. If you I mean for somebody trying to get started, if you look at your payment on that house after you received the rent from your friend was less than your apartment. Oh right? yeah. yeah. So your monthly payment went down by you moving into the house and after the cash out refi you got thirty thousand dollars in cash plus you have all the benefits of ownership of course um so i mean that's amazing yeah i mean i, I was doing i guess house hacking without even knowing the real the term i guess before maybe the house the term was coined you know yeah. similar to the bird strategy refinancing as well you know all that stuff was we we're doing it but it wasn't you know branded at that time yeah. yeah they didn't have a catch name for it yet you know yeah so okay all right we got to get into the first rental what was the situation so i purchased it for 27.9 i believe and um you know i was able to get bank financing because i think i was still working at that point so i was doing all this whilst working i wasn't i wasn't a full-time investor i was still an engineer so my uh I got a, I think I had to put 20% down with, uh, it was Countrywide Mortgage, I believe. That's a name from the past. <laughs> uh, I got 20% down, uh, bought it for 27. And then uh, there was a property management group that was big with the uh, GDRE at that time. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of TLE management, mm -hmm. but anyways. They uh, they were another story too. She she didn't have a property. She did, she wasn't a realtor, so she wasn't even. She didn't have a property manager's license, but she was operating a property management uh, situation. Wow. But but um, they said, oh, she went in there with me, and uh, it's like, okay, well, we could do this. We could do that renovation for like five grand, which you know, looking at it now, it was probably I probably paid too much because it was paint paint and uh, some minor drywall that they were doing, and they charged me five grand, and uh, <laughs> yeah. Wow. But, and it did a shitty job too. So it was like, I paid, I paid five yeah, grand for a shitty job. That must have been some pain. Man. It was, it was five grand for a shitty job. But, you know, you, you live, you learn. Uh, um, but, yeah, so once that tenant moved in, we started having all types of issues. Um, I didn't do enough uh, inspections on the properties. There was some termite situations with it. There was a roofing issue that wasn't properly addressed. So we had some roof leaks in there. Um, and then the sewer lines, there was a, two big trees in the front yard. So the sewer lines kept mm. having issues. And, um, you know, we kept having backup sewer in the basement. So um, we'd have to, you know, constantly keep running it. And then also, um, I finally actually cut, got the trees cut uh, recently. But yeah, the trees are gone now. But that whole situation, the first tenant, was there for a couple of months and she wasn't screened properly. So she ended up leaving. And then uh, once I got 
that that whole property once uh that situation happened i went to tle and i was like hey i'm taking my properties back you know you guys are mismanaging my properties because uh the girl that was renting the property um she shouldn't have got a hold of me to begin with like she kept having issues with the property and i guess the property management group was not responding to her so mm. she looked up my information and called me directly and that's wow. when i got involved you know so uh, when, once i got involved she was like you know um there's all these issues i'm calling the housing department on you because we don't have handrails going up the steps and i, I was like hey you know i told the program get this stuff resolved and they, they were they were kind of dragging their feet so long story short i ended up cutting ties with them and one of the re uh, is things that she had brought up also was that the property management group was trying to steer her to another property that was owned by a different investor that i guess the lady that ran the management group was had a relationship with so she was not only trying to steer people away from my property when she was trying to get it rented she wasn't actually managing it properly when she got it and one of her screening requirements was if they have the first month's rent and deposit that was their qualification <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah there's there's gonna be some problems with that one. <laughs> oh yeah she she uh, she uh she ran a lot of uh, investors uh down because uh that ended up being a big uh downfall for her and the other investors because you know people yes you have people move in the first month the second month yeah. you may get a rental too but then after that it's all downhill so people were going back into these properties two three four months into the new tenant and having to re um, clean the property yeah. up and re-rent it. So it, it was a you right. know cash flow nightmare for the investors. Yeah, there's all kinds of red flags there. No wonder uh, that management company is no more. No, no, no more, yep. yeah, they got sued. And uh, I think it was maybe a bunch of investors sued them and uh, got them, you know, definitely uh, put them out of business. So, okay, you bought it for 27.9, you put about five into it. So we're at about 28, 32,000. And then what did it rent for? At that point it was renting for 575. You know, back, the back then that was 2005, rents were fairly, relatively low. Uh, I think, you know, 575, 600 was, I don't wanna say it was a top rent, but that was kind of like the going rate, I, I would mm -hmm. say, you know, and then that's what it was renting for. And then, uh, yeah, so I wasn't getting much cash flow. I, I did have a mortgage on it. I ended up refinancing the mortgage. And, uh, you know, I was able to get an appraisal. I, I did a burr pretty much again. They refinanced it. I think they appraised it at like 48 uh, or 48 or 50. I can remember, maybe 50. And I pulled out 42,000. So I, I did get some money back on it. But, I mean, all that. I ended up paying the cost for that because I had to go back and re-renovate re that property mm, two, two yeah. more times over the course of the next uh, 15 years, you know, so it, it's been a, uh, but I think we finally did it right this time, uh, this last time, because <laughs> that second time I was still uh, naive in my, uh, in my real estate uh, game, so to speak. So Yeah, I've seen your renovations. I mean, you, you do very nice renovations for rentals. So I, I think that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, what does it rent for now? Right now, it's currently rented at 875. Uh, 875. Um, it doesn't have a garage, but I, I put a shed back there for the new uh, tenant. So, I think that's extra storage for them, and they're pretty happy with that. Uh, but yes, yeah, renting for 875 right now. So, I mean, I would, I know that would not be fun in the beginning dealing with all the tenant problems and property management problems and everything else. But that still seems like a very successful deal to me. Yeah, yeah, I mean, overall, I think it is gonna be a successful deal. You know, I'm, I'm in it for the long game. So, you yeah. know, you are gonna take some losses. Um, but it's that's not, I don't consider them losses. They're all lessons, right? You, you know, this, you could read every book you want, but interactions and real life uh, investing kind of teaches you, you know, the, the real game, so to speak. So at the end of the day, these are all lessons that if I paid a hundred grand for college, I'm paying maybe, maybe similar for real estate investing, but at least real estate investing is going to make me my own boss. You know, it's not going to have me go work for somebody in a business that was going to fire me tomorrow and say, Hey, orders are down. So we're going to, we got to let you go, you know? Yeah, completely. That's awesome. 
And I think it should be very encouraging for anybody, you know, for a lot of people, I think if they bought their first rental and the property manager was screwing up and overcharging for repairs and the first tenant left after three months, they would feel like they'd done something wrong or maybe this wasn't the right thing to do. So I think it's encouraging for people just to see that it it's not always roses. No. You know, not every deal is perfect. You just got to keep moving forward and just keep working at it. Right. Sure. And the first deal, you know, I've, I've heard this several times on other podcasts. The first deal is just to get you to realize that you can do it. You know, subsequent deals are the ones that you're going to make the real money on and hopefully you take the lessons from the first one. If if you hit a home run on the first one, I think you are probably at a disadvantage because you don't know what you don't know. And whereas the first deal, if if you have a few issues and you kind of get, you know, build some uh, toughness you're like really okay there's there's a few things that we can handle now there's stuff that we know about so that will you just kind of add more tools to your tool belt yeah just get better right as you oh, go yeah. just oh, keep yeah. improving so what did you when you started what did other people think you know when you were single 20s did was that what everybody was doing all your friends or what they no, think no was, no you know Real estate is kind of like uh, anything else. It becomes a cult for you. Once you, you know, it's kind of like um, CrossFit and stuff like that. Once you start doing it, it's like, why isn't everybody doing it? Why isn't everybody doing this? You know, so so I became one. Talking about it. I can't stop guy. talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I kept asking people, you know, are you doing real estate? You know, it's like, no. Nah. And, you know, there's always that one uncle that had poor property management tendency. So, you know, they had the shittiest tenant and, that's how people are going to find like, oh man, I don't want two o'clock phone calls for toilets and two, 2 a.m. phone calls. And this guy tore up my, my, my uncle's house. And, you know, it's like, yeah, he probably did because it was a shitty tenant. You know, you, if you don't screen tenants, you're going to get shitty tenants. And that's, you know, um, some tenants do go bad, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's you got to be good with your screening process. You know, you got to be good with it. But I, I talked to everybody, you know, I was talking to my coworkers, ended up finding one or two coworkers that were kind of one was a flipper and the other guy was kind of holding a few rentals, but they weren't uh, true, I wouldn't say investors. They were, you know, I, I, I don't even want to call them part-time investors, but it was something that would, it was part-time investing. They were doing some stuff on the side. So hobby, they weren't, almost. yeah, hobby, I guess <laughs> might've been the right word for it, but they're not, they weren't fully committed to it, you know, and I was kind of like trying to get fully committed. Like, Hey, this is, once I, once this thing goes all the way out, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm leaving my job and, you know, doing real estate full time, so to speak, you know. It's awesome. Yeah, but so people what, weren't into it. You know, people were just doing their own thing. What about your family? Were they encouraging you, telling you you're crazy? No, you know, um, it's my dad um, and my family always had some property, but it wasn't, it was kind of like, a, I don't want to call it a nest egg, but it was, it was, it wasn't in this country. It was actually in uh, my uh from Ghana, it was in Ghana. So my parents, my dad has some houses in Ghana and uh, those were kind of like, I don't want to call them family houses, but they were still being rented out, but it wasn't a true money maker. It wasn't like, you know, it was more like at the end of the day, somebody could inherit these properties and, you know, maybe sell them or whatever, but it wasn't something that he was like, okay, this is a business. I need to make X cash flow from these or, you know, <laughs> something like yeah. that. It was just, they were rented, they weren't causing any problems and they were just, you own houses and at some point maybe you could pass it down to your kids or, you know, use it as a retirement income or something like that. So, but, um, my, so, but my dad being from the old school, so similar with my mom, they kind of, you know, they stress education. Hey, you know, you want to make sure you keep your job and, uh, you can still do it on the side, but nobody discouraged me saying, oh, you're crazy or nothing like that. It's just, Hey, you know, yeah, that's cool. You're doing that just to focus on your, you know, fifty thousand dollar a, a job with a the steel company, and you know, make sure you don't lose that one. Don't burn any bridges. Don't right. burn any bridges. <laughs> yep. So, what was your vision in the beginning? Did you want to conquer the world and and be the next Carlton Sheets, or replace your day job income, or or what was the initial goal? This is the only time I'm going to shout this guy out. I I, I think I, at that point I even might have thought about becoming Trump. 
you know. Oh man, <laughs> almost, wow. almost. Yeah, back then, I, before I knew better, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here. Folks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> before before I knew better, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, the whole point was, yeah, we're gonna, I'm gonna build a rental portfolio. I want to, you know, have income where. At some point, I don't necessarily have to work, but you know, I have income that is coming in whether I was working or not. So I definitely w jumped straight to rentals. I didn't even do any flips or nothing. And you know, rentals are a little bit hard, harder game. I think they're the hardest part of real estate because you're whatever really? mistakes. Yeah, I, 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 I believe the rental business is the hardest part of real estate because when you flip a house and you sell it, you're done with it. You know, when you wholesale a house, you're done with it. When you hold a rental, whatever mistakes you made renovating that property or whatever issues come with that property, you have to deal with it. So it's an ongoing thing for you. You have to um, you have to be dedicated to your future self. At least that's how I look at it. Any 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 improvements that I do to this property is my future self going to be happy with it. You know, so that's why I was saying like that first house that I had to go back and renovate. It's like I went back and I'm like, damn, I can't believe we did this. Uh, you know, S word, this, this BS to this house, you know? So it's like, I wasn't true to my future self, but with the stuff that I'm doing now, I'm being true to my future self that when I go back 10, 15 years from now, I'm like, yeah, we did this, we, this thing was done correctly. We renovated correctly. The houses are nice and we're, you know, I'm, I'll be proud of them today and I'll be proud of them 15 years from today. I, that's great. I love that being true to your future self. So and treating your business or your properties how you would want them to be treated 15 years from now. That's oh, yeah. great. I think, I know, especially from my experience, you know, in the beginning, I was just trying to get a little bit further along. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of thought to what will my portfolio look like in 15 years. Sure. So, sure. Um, but I think that's a great transition. You know, um, once you get to a certain point, you're building something long-term, you know, once you get past that day to day or month to month or whatever, um, you need to start looking for building something long-term. So oh, that's yeah. awesome. Oh, yeah. So what was, what was it like after that? How'd you start building your portfolio or growing your business after that first rental? So, I mean, I picked up a few more rentals. Uh, I think I got up to about nine rentals between 2005 and 2007, 2008. And I think I did one or two flips in there in between that. Um, but, but the market crashed. Uh, I didn't have solid fundamentals. I was kind of still, I, I hadn't educated myself correctly. I hadn't um, situated myself with uh, construction crews or good construction crews like I should have. Um, thinking I was saving money doing some of the work myself. So, you know, the first mm -hmm. nine properties, I was still involved in day to day. Um, renovations and stuff like that. I actually ended up quitting my job in between um, buying the rentals and kind of um, between, I think I quit my job in 2006. And part of it was that there was a strike at the steel making facility and they had us kind of staying overnight over there. And then they brought in um, individuals that were supposedly strike busters, but they weren't properly trained. And I, I didn't feel safe in that environment because it was like, yeah, we're dealing with uh, tons of molten metal and these guys are you know people that are just not properly trained and I was like I'm, I'm not going to be here so I went into real estate full-time so I was renovating helping with renovating houses I had a handyman helping me but he was a glorified uh, drug head that was enough to you know functional drug head so you know it, I'd, I'd have to go pick him up we'd have to go get materials uh, you know, it, it, I think was, I hired him too at one yeah. point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I did everything wrong. I mean, this, this, this but I, I don't say what's wrong, but it's it's a learning experience. It's all part of the learning process. You, you, if you know, you don't have to do it this way, but you know, it's <laughs> it teaches you a few things. You, you get to uh, know a few things as you do it. Uh, but anyways, long story short, I ended up um, buying buying about nine properties between 2006, between 2005 when I started to 2009, and then uh, the, uh, 2008. And then when the market crashed, I, I, I didn't have um, the fundamentals in place and I wasn't, you know, the money had dried up. So it was like, I think I gotta go back to engineering. So I, I went back to corporate America, I found another engineering job. And uh, I was, I worked actually 
between 2009 to 2015 when we bought another property. So I didn't buy any property between 2008 to 2015, I think, 2014, 2015. Wow. And then picked up some more units at that point. I picked up, I think, we flipped, we flipped one. We bought one flip and bought one rental. And then uh, between 2016 and 2020, I think we picked up, um, I guess, 26 properties uh, in between those uh, four years. But uh, uh, 2016, when I was working for another company, the company uh, decided to close its doors. So that's when I started wholesaling full time. So instead of going back to corporate America, I'm like, you know, I've been, I was kind of rewinding back a little bit between 2008 nine and 2012 2013 i was kind of watching the market you know I, I was i was still watching the market i just wasn't participating in it so I, I was watching all these houses and i'm like man that's a deal you know these houses were selling for cheap I, i'd see houses that were listed for ten thousand, and they looked like they could be rent ready for five thousand you know in in uh, renovations and i just didn't have the money or the, I didn't, no it wasn't even the money it was the know-how I didn't have the knowledge to put that deal together, mm -hmm. but you know, these were being bought by our, our buddy Pete, you know, Pete was buying them all. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd look at him and I'm like, Oh, Pete, bought, I, 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 you know, you could track the history on the county website. So I look at it, Pathfinder or Octagon Holdings and I'd be, I'd be looking at it. It's like, so every deal that I thought was a deal was selling. So it kind of gave me a good feeling that the market that I was tracking, even though I wasn't participating, it was, uh, I knew what, how to spot a deal. You know, I knew what a deal was. I just wasn't participating. So I think about 2014, 2015, when I, um, we kind of got comfortable again, that's when I, I was like, right, we got to get back in, you know, we got to get back in. And, uh, we start, we bought, um, like I said, we bought one house as a rental and bought one as a flip. And when I say we, my wife is my, uh, silent partner in this business, but we bought one, and then uh, we flipped one and the uh, uh, flip kind of got, we were in an area that was a little too, uh, it was too close to a rough area. So we had a very expensive house close to a rough area. We, we did a very nice renovation, but we weren't moving it cause it was just, you know, people would come in and go see, they'd have to drive through a rough area. It's like, yeah, you know, I, I don't want to, it was, uh, I think it was I remember that one. Was it? Yeah, it was on uh, Bryn Mawr. University Row? Yeah, University Row. It was, yeah. yeah. So ended up selling on a, um, not a land contract, but it's owner financing to uh, the Mustard Sea Foundation. And uh, they've been paying well, you know, so, but they put a, put down a big down payment. So that property um, kind of taught me, okay, if you're going to flip, first off, it was, I think it was a 3,000 square foot property. It was probably more. So it was like, okay, that we kind of came up with some of our first criteria. We're never flipping a property that's greater than 2,500 square feet, you know? Um, so that was one of our, and you know, I may do it now, but I, I, I shouldn't have done it because I didn't know the calculations, you know, a 3,000 mm -hmm. square foot house is tech, it's probably three houses, you know, it's two, two and a half, three houses, right. you know? <clears throat> so you, you have to, all your numbers double. If, if you're thinking, <laughs> you know, 1,500 for paint, this becomes, you know, probably 4,500, 5,000 for paint in this house, you know, so everything kind of doubles or triples when you're doing a big house. So we kind of came up with one of our first criteria, you know, not if we're going to flip houses, they're going to have to be uh, less than 2,500 square feet, you know. Sure. So after that, you went full-time wholesaling, wholesaling, right? Yep. When, you, when you got left your job and yep. what was that transition like? Oh, it was a little rough. It was a little rough. Um, so I, I had to study wholesaling because back in the day I, I heard of wholesaling, but I just never really put it together. You know, you know, cause I bought a, uh, we had it part being part of GD Rio, we had multiple, um, I don't know what to call it gurus or people coming around and selling different, uh, products and also talking about different strategies. And yeah. one of the guys that came around actually, uh, talked about wholesaling. And so I, I think I still had his information packet. So I, I kind of looked that up. Then I, I looked up some of uh, Venus old uh, wholesaling stuff documents. So I started educating myself. Then I also got on bigger pockets, started, um, you know, blowing through the podcast. I was kind of, I, I listened to it at like 1.5, 1.5. 1. Yeah, 1.5. <laughs> so I kind of, you know, blowing through them and just getting as much information as I can. Yeah. Uh, but I focused on the wholesaling uh, 
on the wholesaling podcast because um, we had the money that we had invested into that uh, flip over that was not didn't that we had to sell owner financing was our own personal money, was our own uh, money. So we um, that took away a, a big chunk of our capital. So I was like, well, I got to find a way to invest in real estate, which doesn't require a lot of money, but I could still participate and maybe build up some more capital. So that's when I, I came up to wholesaling, and then I started looking at purchasing uh, uh, lists. You know, you could buy online lists, high equity lists, and then also uh, doing what they call driving for dollars. You know, driving through neighborhoods looking for vacant houses, and uh, kind of writing them down. Because prior to even doing wholesaling. When I saw a vacant house, I thought, "Oh, maybe the bank owned it." I never even it never even came mm. into my mind that a, a vacant house could be owned by somebody that didn't want to, didn't want nothing to do with it. That never crossed my mind. It was like, "Oh, the bank owns it. It's, it's a bank owned." It's like, no, not every vacant house is bank owned. There's people that own houses free and clear. I think the stats I had was, you know, 35 percent of houses are owned free and clear or something like that. You know, so, you know, that's sure. So yeah. walk us through, like. Uh, a standard wholesale deal. How did you, how would you find the deal? What did you do with the seller? And then how did you make your profit on it? Well, the, the first, I mean, the, the first deal I ever did, did as a wholesale, I found it driving for dollars. I saw it was a vacant property. I got the address down. Um, the owner had moved um, a couple of hours away. And I think they moved away because they, you know, the way they thought they were going to get foreclosed on, but the, you know, in this area, we had that issue with banks not foreclosing on houses and kind of yeah. leaving them. So anyways, I called him and I was like, Hey, you know, I see you have this house over here. I'd like to buy it. And, you know, we kind of talked about it. I did, uh, they did decide to sell it and they had a representative up here. They had a lady that they knew that was a, a notary. So they had her kind of handled, facilitate the deal. And I, I mean, I had a, a title company do a title search to verify there was no liens on it, but we didn't actually do a title, go through a title closing. The, the lady was a notary and literally she notarized the deed. She had a notarized deed for me. And then uh, I took it to the county and got it recorded and transferred, which which is a big no-no. I mean, it's not a big <laughs> no-no, but it's, 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 not, it's not ideal. It's not ideal. I mean, if you understand what you're doing, I would say, yes, you could do it, but I said, newbie people shouldn't do that because you, you, without doing the title search you don't know what's on the deed but uh what's you know what other links are attached to that property so that first deal i um i got it for like 3500 it had a little bit of back taxes on it and then uh maybe 3000 in back taxes and then i ended up selling for 17000 so that became like a proof of concept you know we just I just made 11 grand, you know, yeah. 10, 10, 11 grand. So it was like, sweet. So, you know, we rolled that into doing more driving for dollars. Um, also, you know, looking for vacant, other vacants and then doing the mailing list. So I started mailing postcards or letters, yellow letters to um, property owners. Hey, we're looking for, to buy houses in that area. So that, that, that was how the first deal kind of came about. But uh, Okay. And do you close with your money and then? Yeah, the uh, you know, I, I did. I closed with my money. So, you know, it wasn't a typical wholesale deal where you would, uh, let's say, negotiate with the seller, get a contract, and then um, try to assign the contract. I actually got on the deed. You know, I, I, was the, I became the owner of the property, and then I was selling my own property. But yeah. I was selling at a wholesale price because it was it was still needed, it still needed work. I just didn't want to, you know... Um, yeah, I, I don't want to fix it up. I didn't have the money to fix it up. And how did you remarket that or how did you find your buyer? Yeah, so to? as you mentioned, you know, we're, we're part of GD. We are also part of the Advanced Investors Group and then also part of different Facebook groups. So I started posting uh, properties up there. And I think I might have put a for sale by owner sign in the yard as well. You know, so I think uh, I think that's where this guy came from. He was a, a local contractor. Um, and he, you know, he owned a couple of, he owned some houses down the block from it. So I think he wanted to live in this house. He owned a duplex down the block and I think he wanted to live in this. So he, he saw the opportunity. It was, it was actually a fairly nice house. I mean, it's one of those, that's, if I were in my position right now, I would have kept it. <laughs> it's a nice, it would have been a nice rental for me. Yeah. But, but back then I needed to wholesale it because that's where I was in my, in my business model. So I needed to wholesale it, but it was one of those where 
if I got it today, I would have kept it as a rental. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd be making a bunch of money off it right now. <laughs> but I made 10, 10 grand or 10, 11 grand. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not mad. You know, I made money off of it. And then 10, 11 grand, I know, you know, furthered your business and you're making sure. money, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. You know, yeah. So. yeah. Cause you have to invest it back into a business. You have to grow your business so that it's all part of that, uh, you know, the steps to get to where you, we are now. Yeah. So how would you, you know, if somebody's interested in getting into wholesaling as that first step, what recommendations would you have for them to get involved with it? So, you know, I've, I've had quite a few people kind of contact me about wholesaling. And um, one of the, what I usually tell them is you, you have to get the education. Um, I see the biggest issue with a lot of these new wholesalers is they've never actually done a renovation. You know, they're, mm. um, so that's where they are weakest, you know, and, and a lot of people lack their education. They, they hear about it, the, um, a wholesale, wholesale sounds like it's going to be easy. So they hear about it. Oh, I just find a seller, get a, a property in a contract and, you know, I make 10,000 or 20,000. It doesn't cost me any money. It doesn't I cost me it. Exactly. You know, so <laughs> yeah. with, with that in mind, it, it kind of brings out the, everybody and their mother wanting to be a wholesaler and they're all wanting information. And, you know, the information is out there. You could, you could, you know, you go on YouTube and you can find, you know, 200 wholesale, uh, wholesalers with videos talking about how to wholesale, you know, but people sometimes want you to hold their hands. And uh, I forgot what was the question. <laughs> and what would you recommend for them or how would well, okay, yes. they get started? So, so <laughs> I, I would recommend that they, you know, get, educate themselves and you know you can go on youtube like i said you can find a bunch of different people that are going to give you the the same information and then i would actually recommend um you know jay scott from bigger pockets has a book on uh renovations and mm. this is the first time i actually kind of put it together but i would recommend somebody read that book on how to estimate rehab costs you know that cause the the, the biggest disconnect that like i said i see with young wholesalers is that they don't know how to estimate rehab costs and they also don't know what the final product looks like. So when, when you don't know what the final product looks like and you look, you go look at a house, it's like, Oh, the walls look fine. The, you know, <laughs> this ain't too bad. We can keep the kitchen. It's like, to me, just cause it's cabinets doesn't mean it's good. It, 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 I, could, I, I would go in and gut it. You know what I'm saying? So that the cabinets might as well be gone. Cause I'm, I'm not going to reuse those cabinets. I, I reuse cabinets if they're good, but if, you know, they're kind of beat up and they're old. I'm not going to try to paint my cabinets and, and kind of, you know, use yeah. that, you know, so I, that's not my style. So yeah, I, I'm going to gut that kitchen. So, but the other people, the young wholesalers might start thinking, oh, I think they could use that cabinet or the floors don't look too bad. They could mop it or something. Like that. You know, it's like, yeah, there's yeah. stuff that needs to happen, you know, to, for you to get to the final product. So I think the biggest disconnect is knowing what the final product looks like and also knowing how to estimate properly to get to the final product. Yeah, I, my biggest frustration when I see wholesale deals come in is either a crazy inflated ARV, you know, which justify numbers or a very inaccurate rehab estimate. Sure. So, yeah, I think, you know, if, if uh, somebody's interested in wholesaling, that's where they need to need to start. I think that's great advice. Seems to me, I've never wholesaled, but it seems to me too, a lot of wholesaling, once you have the information is just hustling. Oh yeah. Just oh, yeah. putting in the effort and the time and talking to the, to the number of people. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all a numbers game. You know, um, when I was truly wholesaling and focused on wholesaling full time, I was sending about um, maybe 8,000 postcards um, a month. And out of that, I'd probably get three, three, four deals, I'd say, you know, so, so about maybe one every 2000 deals, you know, every 2000 postcards, you get a deal. So, you know, um, that was one way to get deals. And then I, like I said, I, I always, I always like driving for dollars because when the driving for dollars kind of gives you the immediate, when you mail into a list, let's say you mail into a high equity list, you just mail into people that own their houses uh, almost free and clear or with little mortgages on them. So there's no real motivation on that list. You just mm. know that the high equity list people might be able to sell at a discount because they don't owe a bank a lot of money to pay off. You know, that's, that's a, why you mail to a high equity list. But when you're doing a driving for dollars and you come across a house that is either vacant or heavily uh, dilapidated, 
you know there's a little bit more motivation with that individual because you know if it's a vacant property and the landlord lives you know even if them to live, live 20 minutes away they still have that in the back of their mind you know i gotta go do something with that property the city is either on me or you know just you know the neighbors might be on me because they may, may they may even stop cutting the grass you know what i'm saying so it's just um those type of individuals have a problem that needs to be solved and that could be as easily as yeah i'm ready to get rid of it I, I, you know it's got too much work in there the last tenant messed it up i don't have time or the money to fix it up so i'm willing to discount it and sell it to you quickly and move on get it off my mind get it off my books sure that's awesome yeah, I know still when sellers call, you know, the first question is why do you want to sell the house, right? Because right. I think that that motivation level is is really the key to everything. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's awesome. Great advice. So, where did you go? How did you transition? Could you still do some wholesaling, but that's not, you know, the primary focus. How did you scale your business from there or grow to where you are now? Well, um, you know, I, I got good enough that I was making some very good money wholesaling. And I, at one point, you know, I, I was closing enough deals where I think I averaged right around between 25 and 30 grand a month wholesaling, you know, so once you build up enough capital, then it becomes an issue. Where do I place that capital, you know, and part of that capital was okay. Now we need to start holding some of these properties that we're coming across and building our, our rental portfolio. So it, it was a, um, it wasn't an easy transition, but it was a, uh, the next step transition, which is, all right, instead of getting, having uh, uncle Sam tax me a lot, let me put some of these money into, uh, into some rentals and also build up my portfolio. Cause that was the original game. You know, I think one of the things I, uh, one of my, uh, numbers that I had was for every four deals that I wholesaled, I wanted to keep one, so to speak, you know, so, okay. um, so that that kind of started transitioning and if i like the area and i like the property and the property wasn't too uh bad off for renovation because i still you know i have you know as not all crews can do everything right so as you build up your construction knowledge and your construction crew base and you know okay the crew that i have right now can handle this stuff this type of renovation then when you come across a property that fits that model, you could say, okay, I, I can have my crew handle it because it's not going to be too much of a headache, you know, and as you build your uh, construction uh, contacts and you you find any and everybody to, to do everything, then you could handle, you know, maybe a burned down house or a, a foundation that is broken away or something like that. But when you're still building that um, construction contact, you, you just see, okay, these guys can handle kitchen, bathrooms, flooring, paint, you know, I, I got a guy that does furnace, I got a guy that does roofing, I could, a guy that does, you know, so you can start handling all those things and like, the projects don't seem as bad because it's just, it becomes a, num a money number, how much is going to cost me to get that done, you know, so to speak. That's awesome. And I mean, I wish you would have told me that a couple of years ago. <laughs> 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 I was thinking about, man, my worst headache project really was where I tried to have my normal contractors do work that was outside there. Oh, yeah. Um, it it always, it, it, that, I thought, oh, it's not that big a deal. It's not that different from the, their norm, but holy mackerel, the headaches that came from um, getting them outside their comfort zone. Never, and that's, yep, and that's uh, something you learn you learn based on the, uh, you know, trial and error. So it wasn't like I, you know, that was from a couple of having guys do stuff that they weren't supposed to be doing, you know, because anytime a guy says I can do everything, I kind of <laughs> like, oh, he, he, that means you can do nothing, right? You know? <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. So, so what do you, what's your focus now, you know, with your business? How do you operate? Yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm still doing wholesaling, but it's a, uh, a small part of my business, you know, I come across, I'm marketing for deals and some of those deals are for part of my flip business and also some of my rental business. So if I come across deals that fit any of those models, I'm keeping them for myself. If I come across deals that don't fit any of that model, then I try to wholesale those deals and try to, uh, you know, get the capital to fund my uh, rental portfolio. Sure. And what kind of marketing do you like to do now? 
Uh, I still do a little bit of uh, direct mail marketing. I'm doing Facebook ads now as well. Um, so those are the two main things. Um, driving for dollars is still one of the things that I do, but I, it's not a, you could do driving for dollars in, in two ways. You could do it as a structured driving for dollars where I'm going to look at the map. I'm going to drive this specific neighborhood and get all the houses in that neighborhood. Or you could do what I do, which is oh, I'm driving and my eye catches a house that looks vacant. And then I write it, uh, either, you know, pull over and write it down or put, send it as a text to my assistant say, hey, this looks vacant, look into it. You know, it's a vacant uh, house driving for dollars. Sure. So that's my uh, my driving for dollars, uh, my current driving for dollars. But you could, you, you know, I could outsource it. I could, if I had the time, I could get assistance or people to just start driving for dollars and trying to find properties for me. How have the uh, Facebook ads worked out? <laughs> you know, they're, they're, um, we have to tweak it a little bit. Um, it, based on, uh, we tweaked it a little bit, so we're getting much better. Uh, uh, what was it called? Um, leads, because previously we hadn't, we didn't ask any qualifying questions, so we were just getting people that were just submitting prop, uh, not even properties, but just submitting properties, thinking they were going to get like some sort of a, a free valuation or something like that. And it was like, okay. you know, right now we're we're asking uh, a few questions that kind of says, uh, you know, you know, which property do you want to sell? You know, so that that question in itself kind of has people kind of fill that out, and then. Uh, asking for phone numbers and uh, emails because Facebook automatically generates some of those things. And sometimes people update those things and never change it on Facebook. So mm -hmm. the Facebook data could not, may not be accurate. So we're not getting as many leads now. We're getting that maybe a lead every, my ad spend, I guess I'm getting, it says my lead uh, generation is about $58 per lead. You know, okay. so, so I'm getting $58 per lead, but a lot of those are, the truly, you know, I don't want to say a lot, but there, there's, um, they're motivated. There's some motivation there. There's some uh, money to be made there. Not all of them always work for us because the prices they may want may be a little bit higher than we are. But you know, we're still, we're still getting good, good leads, and I'm, I'm happy enough with the leads because it's getting the right type of individual that wants to sell versus just somebody that's, you know scrolling along Facebook and decides, oh, let me see what my house is worth. Let me just punch it in here and see. This guy says, like, make me an offer. Let me see if I get a, a free offer pop-up or something. Yeah, like that. the tire kickers. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, all right. So you have a portfolio of rentals, 30, how many rentals? 35 doors. 35 um, doors. 34 okay. units. So I have one duplex. I just purchased a duplex. And you have a couple crews doing flips. How many flips do you do generally in a year? Um, r right now, I, I don't have a good number on it, but this year I'm probably going to do maybe six to eight um, flips, true flips, I think. Yeah, maybe six, six true flips. Um, but I have the crews are also working on rentals. So the guys are mm -hmm. working on rental. Well, I have one crew working on rentals and one crew working on flips. And uh, it just depends on what I have on the table. But usually the flips take... Uh, preference because I'm always, you know, I'm paying a hard money on that. So I want to <laughs> get those done. Whereas, yeah. some, whereas some of the rentals I buy with cash. So it's not that it, it can sit for longer, but you know, I'm not paying interest on it to anybody at that time. I mean, your business is rocking. That's awesome. So how many people are involved in it? Um, uh, well, it's myself. Um, like I said, my, my silent partner is my wife. So she's uh, always involved. And then I have an assistant that is, uh, does a lot of the lead, uh, lead sourcing. So she calls the uh, incoming leads, try to get that set up. I have a guy that takes pictures for me now for um, whenever we get um, wholesale leads come in. Cause uh, with the COVID and having to watch the kids, uh, I didn't have time to go look at properties anymore as much. And uh, as you know, once you look at enough properties and you get enough good pictures of the properties, you can make a solid assessment, you know, maybe 85, 90% assessment of what a property needs and uh, kind of get in the ballpark uh, without having to actually go to the property to verify a few things, you know, but um, so for the most part, um, I got a guy that I pay $50 a, um, a property to go uh, take pictures for me. And he, he's supposed to take like 50 to 100 pictures of each property. 
and then uh, I could assess the property and make a uh, a deal, uh, make an offer to the seller at that point. That's awesome. Yeah, so yeah. Um, so I'm doing that, um, but and then I have the crews, and you know, there's one crew is uh, I think has three guys, that crew has two guys. So, and how do how did you hire your assistant? Are they local, virtual? Uh, she's now? local. Um, it's actually one of my tenants. Um, She's a stay-at-home mom. Um, she needed some. Uh, she's been in office work before, but she didn't want to go to a real uh, corporate environment, so to speak, because she needed the ability to take care of her her kids as well. So she um, she asked, and I was like, you know, yeah, I'm willing to give you a try. So it's been uh, it's actually worked well for me. She's able to work from home, also go into the office, and then uh, make calls from there. And uh, everything we do is, you know. It's virtual and it's not virtual, but it's you don't need an office. She doesn't need to report to an office to make yeah. calls and you know fill in stuff on that on uh online. So it just she could work from anywhere with anywhere with a laptop and a phone. And is she full time, part time? Oh, part time. She does yeah, I think maybe less than fifteen hours a week. You okay. know. Yeah, so it's very part time and uh it's it's paid for itself, you know. She uh um the good thing about that, her husband is actually a mailman, so he's been getting me some. Uh, nice. for, uh, some walking for dollars leads. <laughs> I, I think we're awesome. actually gonna, yeah, we actually have one deal that we're gonna close on it because she, her uh, her husband brought it to us, so we're you know she's gonna get a bonus for that once we close on it. But yeah, she's uh, we 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 got a deal that we're it's pending. We're still waiting on a title to get to get cleared. But yeah, once everything is said and done, yeah, she'll get a deal for, uh, a bonus from that. That's awesome. Well, I know, you know, so many people I talk to, they struggle with hiring an assistant um, because they don't know how to employ somebody part time or a few hours a week, or, you know, in your case, 15 hours a week. And they think they have to have this a, a large amount of work to hire somebody almost full time. And so I think I think that's great encouragement. They just need to talk to more people. Yeah, and you know, one of my biggest issues was I, I was doing everything myself. So it, um, you kind of start, you don't document your processes and I still haven't documented a lot of it, but I, I did a few videos. I was able to, um, I think use an app on uh, on the computer that allows you to do a screen recording. Um, so I was able to record a few videos for her, uh, kind of walk her through a few things. So I spent a little bit of time, but she's, she's a pretty fast learner. Uh, so she's able to, she's better on the phone with me, you know, people, people are more uh, likely to not necessarily talk to her, but, you know, a female voice is easier to talk to. Mm. So I think uh, she, she's, it's worked out well for me with her handling the calls. And then uh, she has no, the big thing about, I don't, she wants, you know, she's learning the business, but she has no aspirations of being a re real estate investor right now. So she doesn't go in with them. Uh, like when I call somebody, I'm always doing calculations in my head. Like, you know, while they're talking, trying to mm. trying to figure out what what I could get the deal for, trying to do stuff. But when she's talking to him, she's just trying to talk to him. So that takes away any of the edge or any of the, you know. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. So I think That's that a really works good point. Yeah. She's just taking down the information. Yeah, exactly. Analyzing the deal or trying to figure out how to lead the conversation. Yeah. Else. Yeah. And yeah. That's that's a really good point. Sharp. Sure. And I'm sure for her, this is a great blessing to have part-time work. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. well, she, could, she could do it anytime she wants. You know, she doesn't have to. She could work around her kids' schedule, you know, while they're going to school and stuff like that. So it, it's, it works out great for both of us. Yeah. Sharp. That's great. So where do you see yourself going from here? What's the, the vision for the next level? Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned it earlier, too. Probably still not Trump. <laughs> no, 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 I've, I, I'm, 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 I'm just going to focus on being me. And, uh, yeah. that is, All right. There you that's go. right. Um, that, so we're, we're currently at 35 uh, units, 35 doors. Like I said, the next one is, you know, aim, get to 50 and then after 50, maybe get to a hundred, um, still focus on, uh, the rental portfolio building, um, still focus on, uh, wholesaling to generate capital and also flipping to generate capital to support the uh, rental business. Sure. And 
what is it, you know, what's your driving force or what's your main motivator? I mean, ever since I've known you, you're very driven and purposeful and hardworking. What is it, you know, that continues to uh, give you that drive and passion? Well, you know, definitely um, at the end of the day, I, I didn't want to be working for somebody. Um, my family, I want my family to be, not have to want for anything and not have to, in, a, in our retirement age, not have to rely on a social security or anything like that. So having the portfolio that is, uh, you know, generating income that would provide us with everything we need and we'll be able to, you know, give and, uh, you know, to charity when we want to and also live like we want to without any um, ties to any corporations or any nine to five desk, so to speak. Sure. That's, that's great. And for somebody who's, you know, they, they look at where your business is and what you've accomplished and they say, yeah, I want to get there, but they don't know where to start. What would you recommend for those first steps or. I, you know, I've, I've thought about this a little bit that I think the biggest first step is you have to live somewhere. So where, where are you currently living? If you want to get into real estate, what are you doing for yourself? Are you, living in your own house or are you, you know, renting? And if you're renting, then maybe you need to look into house hacking, you know, cause real estate is a long game. And I think people kind of get it uh, m mistaken that, oh, I could make a bunch of money quickly and, you know, be set for life, so to speak. But I don't, you know, even if you make a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand is a lot of money. <laughs> no, it's, 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 that's a year's worth of income that, you know, you, you got to do a hundred thousand next year to, to live. So, you know, it, it's a long game. So um, I think the biggest thing they have to do is your, your first deal has to be maybe looking at house hacking your first property and get, try to get it for a discount if you can. But even if you can't get it for a discount, get it, get a, a, a house where you could rent out, you know, some of the rooms to some friends if you're young if you're older and you have a wife and kid, then maybe look at a duplex or a, a triplex or something that you could live in one unit and then rent out the other units and try to um, cut out your your living expenses, your biggest living expense, which is your um, you know housing uh, allowance. And that money you could actually start saving and put towards another house. You know, so that that is, I think, really the best way to get started in real estate. Sure. Yeah. That's great. So, I mean, I really appreciate you coming on and, and I think you have a lot of great experience and I know people will benefit from all the different things you've done, how to find deals, how to deal with tenants, how to do renovations. Um, and I appreciate everything you've come on and shared today. If people want more information about you or want to find out more about what you're doing, how can people do that? Well, I'm on Facebook. Uh, you could do, uh, you can find my business on Facebook, facebook.com slash Okimbia. That's O-K-I-N-B-I-A. Um, you could also find me on Instagram. I think Instagram at Okimbia, same O-K-I-N-B-I-A. And then uh, those are the two main places. I'm on LinkedIn as well, Paul Amagach on LinkedIn. But those are the places you can find me best. I'm, I'm mostly on Facebook and Instagram. Okay, sure. I'll put those links in the description so people can find out more about you, see the, the level of your renovations and the projects you're working on. And um, I mean, the pictures from your listings, I, I think they'll be really impressed. So I recommend anybody definitely check out Paul and his business and see all that he has going on. So all right. I really appreciate your time, Paul. Thanks for sharing everything. And we'll have to have you on again to, to share more of your current deals down the road. All right, man. Thank you, Chad. Yeah. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Hey, I wanted to share with you an exciting opportunity because we are launching a new mastermind group. And the first meeting is going to start in just two weeks here, the third week of October. And the concept of a mastermind is that a bunch of active investors meet weekly. We're gonna meet online, a virtual meeting, and we share what we're working on, what struggles we're having, ask questions, try and get feedback for how to get our business to the next level. 
So our mastermind is going to have four experienced leaders, which is an amazing resource. So myself, I have a lot of experience in rentals, in property management, and in raising private money. Kurt and Elizabeth Phillips, co-leaders, they have a lot of experience in rentals, house hacking, burr, raising private money, being a financial coaches. And additionally, Chris Mayfield, who you've heard on this podcast a couple of times, he has a lot of experience in wholesaling, doing virtual wholesaling, building virtual teams, working uh, all over the country. And so if you're in the mastermind, you get the benefit from not only all of our experience, but as well at all the experience of the other members. So I know it's gonna be a great resource. It's gonna be great for accountability, and it's gonna be great for getting that supercharged feeling of being around other driven individuals who wanna make their businesses bigger and better. So if you wanna get your business to the next level, I really encourage you to check out our mastermind group, um, you can find more information online on the website, truewealthinvestors.com slash mastermind. There's a form you can fill out there to see if you qualify. But if you really want to get your business to the next level, fill out that form, take the first step. Look forward to talking to you.